The Lord be with you. Welcome to this, which is our final midweek message via YouTube, which is entitled, Why We Worship, Gathering the Hopes and the Dreams of All. So today we conclude our series on our worship for, uh, services and the outline of the liturgy, which is again, we say the work of the people, God's work among us, and our public order of worship. So we conclude today with table talk, and that's the conversation at the Lord's table, where I'm standing right now, I'm facing the altar, the cross is there, the rose window of the stained glass is above us, and this, of course, is the congregational portion that I see when I'm here taking the elements of Holy Communion, facing you, and consecrating them with the words of institution. Now, there, the history of the table, of course, um, goes back to the time of Jesus and the wonderful Emmaus trip he had with two disciples, they are called, which of course is Clopas, his, which would have been Jesus' uncle, and Clopas' son, so he's Jesus' cousin. And they did not recognize him, of course, until the breaking of the bread, which happened in the home when Jesus took the bread, gave thanks, and then as he broke it and served them, he was no longer seen visibly by their eyes. And that is believed to be the first Holy Communion celebration by Jesus on earth since the Last Supper that he gave with his disciples at the Passover. And then that term, the breaking of the bread, became the code word, the church word for Holy Communion celebrations, which continued after the Holy Spirit was given at Pentecost, through the life of the church as they went and gathered in synagogue and in temple and then in house church. And that's where the table grace, as you would, would have emerged. So they still followed Acts chapter 4, the apostles' teachings, the breaking of the bread, and the prayers. So this is the breaking of the bread, the order of worship, the liturgy. The salutations where we begin, the Lord be with you and also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Those emerged at the time, at least as early as the Didache, the apostolic writings, at least 50 to 70 years after the time of Jesus. That grace began. Now the structure of the order of worship that we have, which is that salutation and greeting, then we have what's called the proper preface, which is prayerfully um, set to acknowledge the holiness of God and how he works among us through Jesus Christ and then sets the way for us to prepare our hearts to sing the Holy, 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 which was adapted by the early church time, a hybrid of both the song of Isaiah before God in the temple and the music we will hear of psalms around Palm Sunday coming up this week. The blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. So the Isaiah vision of God in the temple meeting with the vision of Christ on the road to Jerusalem to die is blended together to form a wonderful Sanctus hymn, which is Latin for holy, that emerged and was fixed into the order of worship and liturgy in the early days of the church, most likely at least in written form in the John Chrysostom orders of liturgy we have from the early 100 to 200 time frame. It's hard because the liturgy began spoken form in the house churches. If things were written down, we may not have them. But by the Middle Ages, it was in the form we would have similar today, and that would have been had in Luther's day. And then from that wonderful hymn, sometimes in the, uh, and this goes back to the early part of the Middle Ages, communion liturgies were lengthened, there was more prayers. There's even something called the Eucharistic prayer, which can begin 
um, giving thanks to God for all he has done through the work of Jesus Christ in the history of the church. Sometimes that is brought, the history of Israel is mentioned, the parting of the Red Sea waters, and then that ceases. And then we go into the part of the words of institution, which are the words of our Lord, also called the verba. Those can be spoken or sung. And then sometimes it'll then, following that, the Eucharistic prayer will go into the Lord's Prayer and then a closing prayer called an epiclesis, which is an understanding that we are praying for the Holy Spirit to be among us here during this consecration of elements. That is part of the history of the liturgy. It isn't always used in the Lutheran church. Most Sundays you will hear the salutation and greeting. You will hear that proper preface, and we will sing the Holy Holy and then generally go into the Lord's Prayer, which concludes the prayerful nature of the consecration until we get to the words of institution, the Lord's words. And a reason for that being is we wouldn't want anybody to misunderstand that I as a pastor or we as a church of believers do anything magical or mystical to change whatever we have on this altar of bread and wine into something else. It is the work of God. Even our Lutheran confessions, our book of Concord, which is where our small catechism resides, that Martin Luther wrote himself, says that for a proper consecration of elements, you need bread and wine, two elements. You need a called and ordained servant of the word, a pastor, when there is one, of course, and you need the spoken word of God, that is the verba, the words of institution. And fifth, you need a congregation or people or even one. When we go into hospitals, for instance, we need somebody to receive Holy Communion. That is what is needed. So if the beginning of singing the Holy, Holy, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord is a good way to end and then prayerfully have the Lord's Prayer which can be spoken or sung by the congregation, and then going right into the words of institution that ends with the sharing of the peace of the Lord be with you, and also with you is usually responded. So that concludes the table grace, the Holy Communion celebration. And as I said, there have been Eucharistic prayers where the words of institution are embedded into the prayer. Sometimes there are more prayers in the beginning of the words of institution, and then those end the consecration. Because, as in other parts of life, we want God's word to be the last word. And so we end there so that everybody knows that that common bread and wine that has been set apart by our altar guild, put on our altar for our use, that when the words of institution are spoken and blessed, the Lord's body and blood is there for us to eat and drink. From there, then we usually sing the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, which of course comes from John's Gospel and the confession of faith by John the baptizer himself. Behold this Lamb of God, and now he is ours because he has been sacrificed for us on the cross, which isn't happening again. We do not believe that Jesus is re-sacrificed every time there's a communion, but we do believe that the blessings of that one event that happened in history become manifested to us in the present time by God's grace, by God's word, every time we eat and drink, so that the blessings and the fruits of those cross. The body and blood of our Lord continues to come to us via his grace. The same occurs when a person is baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. From there, usually then we receive the Holy Communion celebration. Currently now, as we are coming out of our pandemic time, still being careful, we have a pilgrim style where it's single file, and I stand at the base of the chancel here, right before the pews, and you receive the body and blood of Christ uh, no, without kneeling at the communion rail, and then go back, return to your seats. Otherwise, we would commune at the rail. And that is a wonderful celebration where we receive God's gifts. And we also believe that as we are receiving the Lord's body and blood as saints on earth, 
the saints in the heavenly kingdom, all that who have died and gone with the Lord at rest now, also worship and commune with us. It's a wonderful family reunion, this table conversation we have. And then following the Holy Communion distribution, when everybody is communed and in their seats, we usually sing a post-communion canticle or hymn. That was devised in the church by Martin Luther. That was his innovation, which he took time and effort to teach the church into in the Middle Ages. That was a little closer to the Reformation time and the Renaissance time when we look at history. And he used the Song of Simeon. Makes perfect sense. As he himself has often said, it's one thing to go to communion with a heavy heart and be sorrowful of sin, but when you receive the body and blood of Christ, receive the forgiveness of all of your sins, why not go back to your seats or to your lives happy, joyful, able to depart in peace because you have received the Christ? Even in a better, more intimate way than even Simeon himself received it. He saw that Christ's child and held it and blessed him and praised God for this. Lord, now you can let your servant go in peace. Your word has been fulfilled. Same with Holy Communion. The word has been fulfilled. The living word now resides in us in that bread and wine. And we are then images of Christ to the world. And so we sing that. Post-communion uh, hymn, is followed by a post-communion prayer, which, like the proper preface I mentioned earlier, is seasonal, and that changes whether it is the season of Lent, which focuses on the cross, or the manna, or the bread of life, or we have ones that focus on end times, where Christ the King is coming and returning. And so then that prayer will emphasize that of the marriage feast of the Lamb and his kingdom, which has no end, that we are happy and grateful to celebrate. Remember, the Eucharist is, in Greek, means thanksgiving. What greater way to give thanks to our God than receiving his food for life? From there, we usually have the benediction and a closing hymn. Those are newer innovations. Newer meaning Martin Luther's time had post-communion prayers. In fact, the ones that are in our Lutheran service book, for sure, the first two choices. You'll have to look that up in the divine services. They are... English versions of the German that he wrote. So we still have obtained those and we're in practically all of the liturgies in Germany and now in North America. And those were penned by him. And so following that, even a closing hymn was not often given. In Latin, it would have been said the mass is over, the service is done, and then people would leave. So we do a benediction, a closing hymn, and that sort of is our way to exit and send us out forth into the world rejoicing. So before we close today, I'd like to have a closing prayer that encompasses what we've been talking about today with the communion table grace. And then I would like to sing our offertory, which we will hopefully, as time progresses and we come out of our pandemic, will return to singing as well as eventually having an offering plate being passed in the service, which we haven't done in two years. But we will do the resume again, and that wonderful communion aspect of the offering is in that gathering the hopes and dreams of all. You'll know what song I mean. But let's first begin with prayer. Gracious God, in the holy meal of your son's body and blood, you have drawn us to your heart and nourished us at your table with food and drink, bread and wine, the blessed body and blood of your dear son. Send us forth to be your people in the world and to proclaim your truth this day and evermore. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior, we pray. Amen. And now that wonderful offertory. Let the vineyards be fruitful, Lord, and fill to the brim our cup of blessing. Gather a harvest from the seeds that were sown, that we may be fed with the bread of life. Gather the hopes and the dreams of all, unite them with the prayers we offer now. Grace our table with your presence and give us a foretaste of the feast to come. 
come. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Depart in peace to serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.